Thank you for uh, coming. The board has now been here, I think, three times. Four yeah, times this is the third years. time. And uh, we keep coming back for more. Yeah. So it's a tremendous credit to her and, and the Torah that uh, she inspires us with. And for those of you who haven't heard her yet, you're in for a treat. So enjoy. Yay. Thank you, thank you. It's wonderful to be here again and to see so many familiar faces. I'm starting to feel very at home around all of you, so thank you for having me. So right now in the Jewish calendar, we are in the month of Iyar, and it's in between Pesach and Shavuot. And this period between Pesach and Shavuot, Pesach and Shavuot are linked by this, this seven-week period, which is called the Omer period. So we're going to speak about ideas today, as you know, and you're getting used to my style, I always bring logotherapy ideas into how we look at the Jewish calendar, the months of the year, the energy of the year, and how we can make it applicable to ourselves and to our lives. So if we are counting days now, we've been instructed to count from the second, you know, day two of after Pesach up until Shavuot, then there's something about counting days. So, um, you know, there's that saying, what, my days are numbered, or, you know, that our days count. So we want to look a little bit today into the meaning of what do our days really mean? What do our days mean? How are we filling our days? Is it just another day we're ticking off because we're waiting to get somewhere else? Or can we actually be really present in today? What does today mean? We see so much tragedy around us. Um, I just watched actually the other day on online um, the D family came together in the hospital to meet all the recipients who um, received organs and um, it was it was just so touching. So Hmm? Yeah, they caught them this morning. Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yes. Okay, so, wow. He was caught this morning, the terrorist. Three of them. Three of them. Wow. Wow, that's really incredible. Incredible. Killed and killed. Killed. Yeah. Caught and killed. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, so we should just, uh, we should all just be able to feel safe and uh, we, nobody should have to go through such um, trauma and uh, immense, immense struggle and loss like this. So, um, because we don't know what is going to happen, as we see from these stories, it's not just a once-off, these things happen. Um, it does kind of give us a bit of a wake-up call, like, how am I living my life? You know, if and when those people woke up that morning, they didn't think they were going on holiday. They didn't think anything untoward was going to be happening. And neither do we. And we shouldn't live in that space of, oh, what if it's today? That's not what I'm saying. But if it is today, I want today to be good. I want it to be meaningful. I want to go out with, this was a day. You know, it's not just a Thursday. It's a Thursday I was given. And I always say to my clients, if you woke up today breathing, it means you've got a second chance. And we're also going to have a look at that today. So that maybe the theme for today was how do we make our days count? How do we make each day count? When Abraham came at the end of his life to Hashem, it says Abraham came to Hashem and he brought all his days with him. So that's because all of them counted. All of them meant something. And how can we take those examples and see, well, how can I fill my days with meaning so that all my days will count when I come to the end of my life. And because we don't know when that is, it means today is the invitation. Today is the invitation. Let's do it today. Let's come and make our days meaningful. So we all know that a story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. That's how stories are. And the Hebrew word for story is sipur. It's a story, it's a collection of ideas and thoughts and proofs or examples. And together it comes together to give a message. right? And this is what our lives are. It's a story of how we live our life. And what is that that we want to be standing for? What is the story that we are going to be telling? So the Omer is a time where we are counting days. We are commanded to count by number. Today is day one, today is day two, 
Ban. We're commanded to count by number. And in Hebrew, the word number is mispar, right? Which is connected to the word sipur, story. The numbers make up the story. It's a collection of days, and then it's a collection of weeks. And those weeks arrive us to, to Shavuot. And it's 49 days that we've been counting. So our lives are also telling a story. And, um, and we get to have a say in what is that story going to be. The meaning of the individual days of our lives and how that accumulates to become the story of our life. You can't say, wow, well, one day I'd love people to remember me for being compassionate if all the time you are, I don't know, a tyrant. Like it can't be that way. You can't want for something. The story has to be written and unfold into what you want it to look like. So on Pesach, we actually got our physical freedom. But that was just the beginning of the story. It's one thing to have freedom, right? When a prisoner is released out of jail, it's like, what now? Okay? So that's where we were. That, we didn't yet know what the story was. We just knew, here starts our physical freedom. We're not slaves anymore. But what did that mean? And in the last class that we met with, we spoke about the process of the Seder, and how we use it to actually find our freedom, how we actually leave Egypt, not physically, but spiritually, emotionally, how we're able to leave those things behind which keep us enslaved. So we're building up to Shavuot, and we have this period now called the Omer, which connects the two, and this is the story. This is where the story is unfolding for us. So Shavuot is when we accept that the moral code, the values that were given to us, which is, how to live that story. It's a blueprint of what we should be doing, how to live what, what we're saying is a meaningful life, how to be of service in this life. So this, that was the spiritual um, connection. First we got the physical, con the physical freedom was Pesach. The spiritual side of it is now at Shavuot. And then still the story continues. Okay? So um, the egg on the Seder plate has two ideas, two, two parts to an egg. An egg is first laid, and then after a certain amount of time, it gets hatched. So this is one of the symbols of the egg on the plate, on the Seder plate, other than the korban as well. But the egg is showing at the time of our physical freedom, that's when we got laid. You've been born, almost as a time of infancy. Then there's this whole period of counting in the Omer, developing, growing, are we ready to even receive the Torah? Or are we still, you know, infants? So it's a maturing process to get to a stage where we are going to get hatched. Okay, that there's a growth that takes place in that egg, almost like a cocooning. There's a, um, a support and a barrier protecting us while we are growing, and that is this Omer period, to the time when we get hatched at Shavuot. So, also, what this Omer was, is a sacrifice that was brought to the temple. At Pesach time, they brought barley. And at Shavuot time, wheat was brought. So these might just be, oh, okay, that's interesting. Both of them grow in the ground, but there's a difference between barley and wheat. And here the story unfolds even more. So barley is just used as food for animals. Nothing has to be done, it's just fed to the animals. But wheat is something where we partner with God. We plant it, it gets grown, and then we can't just eat it in that form. We have to mill it and grind it into flour, prepare it, make or bring all the ingredients together, knead the bread, bake the bread, and then it is ready for us. So there's a creative process that goes on in that as well. So the initial one, which is representing our physical freedom at Pesach time is the, the sacrifice of barley is brought. But as we develop the process, the stage of coming to have that connection with Hashem as well, through this Omer time, we are making bread, so to speak, of our own lives, how we are developing and growing in our own lives as well. So coming out of Egypt gave us the physical freedom but then you've got to be able to do something with it. Actually, it's more pressure because when you are a slave or a prisoner, you know what time wake-up is. 
you know what your work is, you know what's expected of you, what time the lunch break is, where you have to be, what you have to do, what time lights out is, and everything is thought up for you. That's actually quite nice, right? We don't have to think. But when you are free, you wake up and the day is yours. Yours to fill with meaningful activities or yours to waste, right? And that actually is quite pressurizing on us. At each moment the clock is ticking, we are making choices. Are we being kind? Are we wasting time? Are we, you know, whatever it is, fill in the blanks of whatever it is where you feel your life is maybe not being meaningful. So having freedom is actually quite, quite a burden, right? Because we have to do something with that freedom. We have a chance to write our story when we've got freedom. When we don't have freedom, the story is written for you. 8 a.m., wake up. Lunch, 1 p.m., you know, come to work at this time. So what separates us from animals? Because if we're just going to have our physical freedom, then we'll just eat barley all the time, <laughs> right? But if we want to be able to use our time meaningfully and creatively and make bread, then we can move through this process towards Shavuot and receive the Torah from that place. So um, the Omer is a counting time where we count and we say, today is day one, then today is day two. And what we were really counting was how many days we were going to receive, in how many days we were going to receive the Torah. So we knew that we were going to receive the Torah in 49 days. Right? So this is this period. So then if we're counting towards 49, why are we saying today is day one, then it's day two, then it's day three. When I'm looking forward to my birthday, I say, it's five days, it's my birthday, four days, it's my birthday, and two days, it's my birthday. We count down. We don't count up. So what is this whole count up about? So um, I'll explain it to you by just giving a, a small sound of when I broke my neck um, almost a year and a half ago. The doctor said to me, for three months, you will be in this brace from here to here, it's a hard brace, and it literally kept me like this. I couldn't do anything. Couldn't, you, can't, you can't walk down the stairs because you can't do that. You can't drink water from the tap. You can't do anything. You're basically held, trapped in something. And so he said to me, three months you're going to be in this brace. And I was like, wow, three months is 90 days. So I was like, three months is a lot of time to think about. I couldn't even turn my head on the pillow. Right? So it's very confining. And uh, my daughter and I, we took the calendar and uh, we counted 90 days. So we counted day one was 90, then it was 89. So that we knew when there's one more day to go when I see the doctor and this will come off freedom, right? So um, after a few days, I'm counting and counting and counting. I'm moving down and I'm noticing that I'm having a lot of challenges along the way. One of the challenges I had is any time, like the brace was all the way up at the back of my head to hold my head in place. Any time I turned, my hair would get yanked by the brace on my hair. So eventually I made a decision, time for my hair to go. So I went to the hairdresser and I just said, like from here to here, just get rid of everything. And I couldn't think of practicalities or what I looked like. I didn't care. I just couldn't have my hair yanked every second. So... There were things which were difficult and challenging, I'm sure you can connect to that, that were along the way. And even though they might have been small and trivial, it's just a something in the process to the, the end goal, we have to be able to focus on those details as well and also to be kind to ourselves on the process. I remember also when I went to the um, hairdresser, it was a week later, I hadn't taken this off for one second even. And, um, and then when I came home, my sister-in-law had to take it off for me to wash, to wash the pieces in the, all the sponging inside because I'd been on for a whole week. And um, then she was trying to put the whole thing back together and it just didn't fit properly, right? So she was panicking because it didn't fit properly. But then we managed to get it on properly and put it back on me. And I came home and I said to my husband, this doesn't fit me properly anymore. I just don't feel right. I called the physiotherapist and I said, something's wrong with the brace. And, um, and then my husband eventually said to me, he said, well, actually, because there's no hair there anymore. And it like hit me like I was like stabbed. I had no hair. So all, all this hair had disappeared. So there was now something less. It didn't fit me correctly. So I had to get that adjusted. So there were many obstacles along the way. And I realized I can't just count 90 days this is going off. How many days is it coming off? I also want to track 
my personal growth. So what am I struggling with today? And how am I feeling about that tomorrow? And then tomorrow there were new things that I was struggling with. So I changed the calendar. I had one calendar going from 90 down to one. One day it's coming off. And I had another day going from one to 90. Because I wanted to track my progress. I wanted to track my growth, my personal growth. Yes, this terrible thing has happened to me. I'm struggling with it. But what am I doing about that? Right? How am I showing up to this, this pain, this frustration, these losses? Also, I couldn't work. Like, there was so much that was going on around me. You know, so much going on around me that I needed to, I wanted to be able to track my progress and my growth in um, the, my journey to, to well being. So that's what I started doing. So this is what we can understand now about the calendar of counting in the Omer moves from, um, we count from day one, then day two. So I think today we're on day 28 or 29, or something around there. 28? Last night? Last night we counted 28 days. Okay? So, um, so last night we counted 28 days, which means that tonight... We're going to be counting 29 days, right? That doesn't give me a sense of, well, then how many days are we receiving the Torah in, right? Because that's not what we're really counting. We are. We're excited and we're anticipating receiving the Torah, but that's not exactly what the process is right now. It's if last night we counted 28 days, it's 28 days since I received my freedom. It's 28 days since I've been accountable for my physical freedom and how am I doing? Okay, so no pressure. That might feel like, oops, I've messed up. But exactly, and we'll look at this just now in a couple of moments, of second chances. Like I say to my client, if you woke up today breathing, you have a second chance. Okay, and, um, and actually maybe this is a good time to mention this, is... Um, Pesach Shani, have any of you heard of this concept, Pesach Shani? So Pesach Shani is coming up, I think on Shabbat, is Pesach Shani. So what Pesach Shani is here, we really need to go back and clean the kitchens? No, it's not about that, <laughs> not a second, a second Pesach. But what happened at the time of the bringing the Korbanot to the temple at the time of Pesach, if someone was um, Tameh, impure, for whatever reason they'd been in contact with a dead body or for whatever reason, they could not bring the sacrifice. And they went to speak to Moshe and they said, oh, Chabal, not fair, I couldn't get there, is there anything we can do about it? So Moshe spoke with Hashem and Hashem said, you know what, let's make it fair. On the 15th of Iyar will be Pesach Shemi, and then you'll be able to have a second chance. Anyone who couldn't make it for the first one gets a second chance. So isn't that awesome? But actually, we get that second chance every single day. You woke up today, you get a second chance. Just like you chose to come here to learn some ideas, that um, you get a second chance to, um, to, to do things differently. Yes, today, last night, we counted 28 days. 28 days have passed. We never get those days back. But what are we going to do now? So maybe this could be, for all of us, a little bit of a wake-up call. Wow, 28 days have passed. But today is my new day. Today is a fresh day. I get to do um, repair work. I always say that um, to my clients, if, you, if, you, if you've messed up, you've hurt someone's feelings, and you wake up tomorrow, well, you can repair. There's always time for repair. There's always a chance. And we have a second chance every single day. And actually, that can be even taken, taken even smaller. We have a second chance every hour, every minute, every second, right? We always have the opportunity to say, okay, I messed up, but I'm going to do it right now. We have that opportunity at every moment. And when we can live in that mind space, then we actually appreciate time. Time is a gift for us. And then when we are counting our days, they look differently. Okay. So the month of the year, the Jews left Egypt, and the first place they came to was a place called Marah. And Marah means bitter. And as 
we know we are part of the Jewish people, full of complaints. Yeah. They arrive at this place, you to think of all these incredible things that had been done for them, right? The pillar protecting them, the fire pillar of smoke showing them the way, their clothes didn't get dirty, right? There was absolutely everything provided, the plagues, everything had just been one miracle after another. Mm. Yet they arrive and now the water is a little bit bitter and full of complaints. Take us back to Egypt. Why did you bring us into the desert? And full of complaints. So Hashem says to Moshe, take this tree and put it into the water and the water will become sweet. So we might ask ourselves, did the Jews really need to see another miracle? Like, hadn't they seen enough? And once they saw one, they saw them ongoing. The miracles just kept happening. What was really going on in this place with the bitter water that needed to be sweetened for one more miracle to be experienced? So we know that life is symbolized by water. Without water, we can't survive. So life sometimes is bitter. None of us live in Disneyland. We all have stuff that happens to us. Physically, emotionally, financially, in the family, in our relationships, stuff happens because that's what life is actually all about. And um, it doesn't have to be experienced as bitter. So what Hashem was trying to show us now is, let's put the tree in the water, I'm here for you, even in the moments when life might be bitter. So there's this beautiful story that I heard, yeah, Okay, there's this beautiful story I heard um, when I, many, many years ago I was studying to be a, there's a program in South Africa called, called Prepare, which is five sessions that couples have to do, it's by the best thing, you have to do it before you get married, and it's not a Jewish program, it's a program that does an analysis of your relationship, so each, and the, the, each um, pair of the couple they fill in a, um, a questionnaire of like 180 questions. And then a computer analyzes, like they say, they say A, B, C, and then the computer analyzes and gives a printout. And then we meet these couples and we speak about these things. It's about finances, it's about discipline, it's about sexuality, it's about conflict resolution, it's about spirituality, it's about all sorts of things. Sounds and we have five it's brilliant. It's brilliant, it's brilliant. It should be an ongoing thing. Yeah. Look at every country. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's wonderful. And it's called prepare. And their, their motto is failing to prepare is preparing to fail. Oh. So beautiful. So on one of the trainings, there was um, a woman, her name is Hedy Schleifer. And some of you may have heard of her. She's um, the, one of the founders of Imago Therapy. Imago therapy is a type of mirroring where you don't say what you feel, you say what you hear the other person has said. And it's a very beautiful way of doing therapy. So she told this story that about her mom. So she says when her mom and dad were newly married and they were in, I don't know which year it was, 1939 or 1940, they were in um, Poland and they had miraculously received fake passports. And they were now escaping on the train to Switzerland. And they got on the train and they couldn't even say goodbye to the family because it was too suspicious. Everything was private and it was too scary. So they just took with them a small little bag and left their lives and, and got on the train. Now when her parents were sitting on this train, her mom realized she's left the passport behind. And there was no turning back. And she had this like sinking feeling of, oi. So her and her husband started discussing different scenarios. We, they knew that it's stupid for both of them to not have passports. So he was going to use the passport and cross the border. And they made all sorts of scenarios. What if I will try and meet you at this point on this day? Or this point on this day? Or they made a whole lot of different scenarios of what could happen. So her mom realized to herself that pain is inevitable, suffering is optional. So she decided she has no passport right now. These could be the last moments she's going to spend with her husband. She's going to enjoy them and not suffer in this moment. Okay? So that's what she chose to do. 
but she took it even further. She thought to herself, there's a beautiful passport waiting on my dining room table. A passport. She left the passport waiting on her table and she thought to herself, I bless that passport to come into the hands of whoever needs to use it. Okay? So, little did she know that her younger sister came to visit, realized what happened, and thought her sister has left a passport for her to wow. be able to Join. escape to freedom or whatever. So she took the passport and the sister was now, life was also saved. Anyway, they get to the, the border and they come in and they take her away. And they get separated, say their goodbyes, and now she comes, she comes to the SS guard and he's busy selecting people out and doing whatever he needs to do. And she sees that she's a very beautiful woman. And he says to her, stay on this side. You know, you can be my girlfriend or whatever. So she says, no problem. And she's petrified, obviously. But in her mind, pain is inevitable. Suffering is optional. That was her mantra. And then she finds the courage to say to him, after you know all that's taken place, she says, you know what? I mean, look at me. Surely I should just go and go to the hairdresser and fix myself up. An officer of your stature should you know, have someone much better groomed than this. It's a good idea, good idea. And he sends her off to the hairdresser with two guards who stand outside having a smoke while she's getting her hair done. And she takes a chance and she looks into the eyes of this hairdresser, it was a male, and she says to him, I'm in very serious trouble, my life is at danger, can you help me escape? And he takes her out the back and he helps her to freedom. And then she manages to meet up at one of those places with her husband and, um, and they, they, I don't know the rest of the story, but then she is pregnant with this woman who tells the story, Hedy, she's pregnant with her, and she's born in the DP camps or something like that. So, amazing, amazing story that while we're on the way, we all have life, difficulties, struggles, challenges in any realm of our lives. But are we going to connect to the bitterness of the situation, or are we going to maybe look for how can this be sweetened, like when that tree went into the water? That is the message for us. And we also do not have to be doing this alone. This Hashem was trying every day to show us, yes, I've performed all these miracles, but I'm not so far. Every day I'm going to show up. And actually, I think it is tomorrow, the 15th, of, um, yeah. 15th when the man starts to fall. It is if the 15th of a year. The man starts to fall one month later. And it is another message from Hashem. Is every day... I will show up for you with exactly what you need in your life. So we, Hashem was helping us on this process from um, physical freedom to spiritual freedom. You can't just go from one to the other. There's a, a transition process. And Hashem was showing us and trying to say, each day lean on me and I will be there for you. And if that was the message back then, it's the message today too. And can, can we do that? So the acronym for the month of Iyar is Aleph Yud Yud Resh. That's how we spell Iyar. And one of the acronyms is Ani for Aleph, Ani. The Yud and Yud is Hashem's name, Hashem. The Resh stands for Rofecha. I am God your healer. So just if we could just like sink into that statement for a moment and just feel all the times in our lives where that has been true for us. And sometimes when we're in the situation, we might not feel it. Even when I was, you know, all held. There were moments where I felt like I was caged. And then there were moments where I felt like God himself was holding me through the brace. So we will go through different stages. But can we keep coming back to that place of being supported, of being held, of the man arriving at our doorstep? Even though they were strangers in the desert. Everything is dead in the desert. Without God's help, they were so vulnerable. Without that water, they would have been done. Right? So this is what Hashem is trying to, um, to show us. And Hashem also says that um, He will not give us any of the afflictions 
that he gave to the Egyptians. We will stay loyal to him. This is what Hashem is saying. So Hashem is saying in this month, it's a very um, big month of healing. And actually there is a segula, an idea of good luck or good omen. If you're starting medications or having operations, this is the month. Like it's a good time to connect to these things, but not just I swallow the pill, but thank you Hashem for entering my body. This is the month, right? A daily thing. If it's a daily something one has to take, that we connect to the daily healing that is on offer to us right now. Well, you said that man was given from the 15th of the Yeah. So what did they eat before that? They ate, they brought matzah. They ate food. They, well, I think whatever they ate, they had that, that was brought. So there was a transition to, I was even wondering, like, did they eat the, the animals that they had? I'm not sure what they ate, but they ate. They had matzah. They brought food. They were Jewish, you know. <laughs> they had food in every pocket. <coughs> Um, so the 14th of Iyar is Pesach Sheini, okay? And, um, and that is all about the second chance, okay? You're hearing ideas today which might be inspiring you, and it's not about like, wow, I've wasted my life, or we're already at day 28 and I messed up, there's no chance for me. That's not how it works. It's, wow, 28 days have passed, and I haven't had that awareness, but I'd like to incorporate it now with kindness. We never look at ourselves and berate ourselves. We look with kindness and say, yeah, this is in my life right now. It's hard. And I wish it was different. And how can I make changes today? Always I uh, blow up at a certain situation. I lose my cool. But actually I want to try and do something differently. It's not berating. Why am I always so violent or screaming? Why can't I control myself? It's, but it's rather to look at it Finding the sweetness, I have an intention now, I'm willing, I want to, I invite that into my space right now. So we all have this second chance, and it's actually every second we have this second chance. So the month started falling on the 15th of Iyar, which is tomorrow. Pesach Shani is today the 14th of Iyar, okay? So it's actually a beautiful day that we're all getting together. Um, so Hashem gave us this physical sustenance in the desert. He gave it to us. He fed us every single day. And that is something else that made us ready to receive that Torah. Hashem was saying, every day I'll show up for you. You just have to see it. You are the one who has to come out and actually collect the man and take it in. And can we see those things in our lives? So we also see that then we're coming up to next week, Lagba Omer. Okay, Lagba Omer, there's two events that happened on, um, on Lagba Omer. Firstly, the plague that killed 24,000 of um, Rabbi Akiva students ended on this day. And there's an idea that I heard on Shabbat that it's not written 24,000 students, it's written 12,000 pairs of students. And the idea behind that is if something was wrong in these pairs, they were connecting to each other, but on the idea of what's in it for me, not what can I help you, how can I serve, how can I help you grow too, what the good that comes to me, am I just taking that for my own good, or do I help benefit the world around me, and something intrinsic was missing for them in that, they had their idea of what Torah looked like, and how it served them, but not how it served each other, so that, that needed to change, and then, like Baume, we are celebrating the Yotzat of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. So we're mourning, when we add a Yotzat, we mourn actually the loss of potential. This person's light has left the world on this day and wasn't, continue, wasn't able to continue. But when we actually honor that person on a Yotzat, we can continue the light that they shared in the world. And this is what Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai wanted. He was um, uh, the he wrote the Zohar, which is the basis of Kabbalah. He brought beautiful, deep spiritual ideas into the world. And on his yod side, we celebrate the death of what his life stood for, bringing spirituality in the world. And we do that by bringing light into the world. And actually, fire is the only thing that defies gravity, the only thing that goes out when it goes up when everything else goes down. 
And it's another thing that, you know, if I have a piece of a whole cake here and I give everyone a piece, I'm, I'm left with maybe one piece or nothing. But if I have a flame and you need some, and you need some, and you need some, and you need some, and I give you, mine doesn't diminish. Okay? Mine doesn't get smaller at all. And I think this applies to love as well. We can give love out, but ours doesn't diminish. Okay? So these are ideas that uh, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai stood for, and he chose to have his life and his death celebrated through fire. Light fires and connect to the spirituality of that, that I have enough Everything that I need in my life, we said every morning, thank you God for giving me everything that I need. Everything that I need. Even for my difficult situation I'm going through now, I have what I need. Okay, and we thank for that. So um, one day, my daughter many, many years ago, I mean, I'm sure you know that, that sometimes the kids would come home and they would tell you, you won't believe what the teacher did today. And then you're like, I'll speak to her, right? I'll tell her, right? Or I'll get involved. So she came home and she said, Mommy, you won't believe what the teacher did today. She said, we've got this stupid project to do. We're just kids. I think she was 10 or 11 years old. We're just kids. And we have to write this project on what we want written on our grave. <laughs> So she said, can you believe it? You must call the teacher, mommy. You must tell her I'm not writing this, that I'm not doing this uh, project. So um, I said, well, let's, let's think about this project for a little bit. What is, what is usually written on, um, on a tombstone? So, so, so I said, like, um, and I told her, like, what was written on my father's tombstone, kind and generous man, you know, who will forever be missed something like that, I don't remember the exact words. And I said, so, so to write the word kind and generous on a tombstone, you have to be kind and generous, as we said before. You can't just write all these nice things, you know, if, if you weren't that <laughs> kind true. of person. So I said, like, actually, I think it's quite a nice exercise. What would you like people to think about you? And if you want people to think that about you, you have to be that way. Like it can't be, it has to be congruent, it has to fit. So actually it's an exercise to think about. Not like, oh my God, there'll one day be a gravestone with my name on it. But what would I like written there? Think backwards. We're counting now up to the day. We don't know which days we're counting, but we are counting our days. How I live my day to day is what gets written one day, what people remember about us, and the kindness that we do. I have a friend that died young, unfortunately, from breast cancer. She was married with four kids, and she wrote her own instead because she didn't want anybody else to write it about her. Yeah. She wrote her own instead of Wow. And her husband read it. Wow. So amazing. If we could, it's a, it's a if we could write. I was given this in one of these, you know, computer things that they send around to everybody who knows a zillion years ago. But what it was called was called the dash. Mm -hmm. And what's the dash? The dash between your yeah. birthday and your day of death. And what did you do in your life? Yeah, the, the dash. The day between your birth and your death. And, that's and what, what do we do? Right. And that's the story. The story, the sipur. And it comes by counting numbers. It doesn't be, we look at, well, in a year's time, I'm going to do that. And when the kids are at the house, then I'll be able to. When I lose some weight, then I'll be able to. When I've got money, then I'll be able to. You know, when I feel more connected to God or God shows up in my life, maybe then I'll be able to. But not, don't ask me today. Right, so actually, that is actually what is asked of us. So that was how the little exercise went with her, and I think she did write it, and I think it's a powerful thing, and maybe it's something to take home and think about, is that something that I want to write? So also, looking at our modern history, there's no coincidence that huge days like Yom Ma'ot, Yom Zikaron, Yom Yerushalayim, these also fall in this month of Iyar, a time of healing. So if we look at that idea, and this part is maybe a little bit scary, of 12,000 pairs of students were killed because of their way of treating each other or of not treating each other, is we have to look even within our own nation. 
our own government, our own left and right, and see like what's going on here. So this is actually a time that we can maybe look, how can we be making peace? How can we lean a little bit more maybe to the other side? How can we listen more? How can we understand more? How can we be brothers that not in the midst of everything, we all come together to mourn for the D family and then we go back to fighting and hurting each other. Like, we want to be able to look at that and say, like, how can that change too? This is not just a time of counting for my own personal growth, but it's how do we fit into the greater puzzle of I'm Israel as well. So there's also, if we look at the sign, the zodiac sign of the month of Iyar is the ox. Anyone who's Taurus, this is the time of the ox. And um, this animal has immense strength, very, very strong. Okay? And we look at the sign of the zodiac from the month of Nisan is the sheep. Right? The sheep is the follower. just goes where the other sheep are going. And I always say when I go on, on teal, I love hiking, but I'm a sheep. Just I want someone to say, turn right here. We're going to see that. That's where we're heading. And I just want to enjoy the scenery around me. And I want to just be led to the final destination. So there are times when we need to be a sheep and times when we need to be an ox. But we're not one only. And then if we look at the month of Sivan, it's twins, Gemini. So it's saying that to get from Pesach, which is the time of the sheep, we need to go through experiencing the ox and bring both those two characteristic traits together to receive the Torah. We have to find both of those within us. Sometimes we are the leader and sometimes we are the follower. But we're never just one of those. And even if we are a leader, great leaders lead by listening and learning from everybody. So even when you are a leader, there are times to be the follower as well, to listen. So the Omer is the time of counting our individual days and making them count. Right? And if we didn't do it up until now, we get that opportunity to do it now. We get to say that maybe even just tomorrow or today I'm going to try differently. And if we get into bed tonight and we think, Wow, I had this great intention of making my afternoon good and I messed up. That's okay. If my intention is to make it different, then tomorrow I can try again. And that's exactly how life works. And this is the process. So if we all knew, and we know that this is true, <laughs> and if everything we knew was true, then we would all be thin, rich and happy. But sometimes the things we know are true are hard to put into place. So it's with kindness that we look upon ourselves and take ourselves on this journey into kindness. So I want to just end off, oh, there was something I was meant to read that I skipped. I'm going yeah. back to it. We still have a few minutes. Okay. This Rabbi Ben Greenberg says, the 18th century Italian mystic and philosopher, Rabbi Moshe Chaim Luzotto said, that the reason Pharaoh increased the physical labor of the Israelites after Moses made his first plea for the, their release was to further suppress their spirit because the fatigue and tiredness of the body destroys the aspirations of the spirit. This is the intention behind the count between Pesach and Shavuot. The Talmudic rabbis teach that every person in each generation is obligated to see himself or herself as having left the servitude of Egypt. And an intrinsic part of that process is the progressive march from the experience, as we said, from physical freedom to a full of freedom encompassing not just body, but spirit as well. The rituals of the Pesach Seder help us reconnect into the experience of the Exodus and the deeply important ritual of the Omer help us walk and move through the through our own deserts right, towards a life of whole and total freedom. The Ome brings us to a stop to reflect that every day and every moment counts. Every day is a unique and precious opportunity to walk the journey towards a freedom of purpose and a freedom of dignity. And that's what this process is all about. And if you think of it, we left this 
this country of Egypt, which was the, I don't know, the New York of the time, you know, the forward ahead in everything um, that it had accomplished. And we went into a desert. The desert is where nothing is happening. The desert is where it is a clean slate. And it was also thought of in that way. God didn't say, well, let's go to Jerusalem and I'll give it there. I'll give you the Torah there. He specifically said, each person will receive the Torah for themselves in this blank slate where there is a desert, where not much is happening because you get to then take the steps into writing the story of what you will do with that. So to end off for today, I want to just read a poem. It's an anonymous poem. <clears throat> and it speaks about the value of time. Because we're saying, our time is precious. The fact that we got to this time and that we've got more of it means we're not done yet. Hashem still says, as we say in the morning, with Moda'ani is, Rabba Emunatecha. How much faith you still have in me? You woke me up today. You've got faith in me, like no pressure, but you have faith in me. What am I going to do with that? And that we can only choose through our own free will, because we are not slaves anymore, how we will use our time. So the poem says like this. If you want to know the value of a fraction of a second, ask an Olympic sprinter who has missed the gold. If you want to know the value of a second, ask the person who has missed an accident. If you want to know the value of a minute, ask a person who has missed the train. If you want to know the value of an hour, ask two lovers waiting to meet each other. If you want to know the value of a day, ask the editor of a newspaper. And if you want to know the value of a week, ask the editor of a weekly. If you want to know the value of a month, ask a mother who has delivered a preterm baby. And it's an anonymous poem, wow. and it actually, Amazing. it's beautiful. It just Did takes us into, us? I'm happy to share it with yeah, you. I'll send it to Shoshana. Yeah. Um, it just takes us into the preciousness of this second and this second and what we can do with this second. And if I've messed up all those ones before these seconds, then you know what, this afternoon I can go to my child and say, I didn't speak to you with respect yesterday, I'm sorry. I didn't give you the attention you needed, I'm sorry. Because now this second becomes more precious. And then these are the things we bring at the end of our lives. So, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much.